You know, my hometown is Greenville. Most of y'all know that, Greenville, North Carolina. Um, and I go there at least once a year usually, maybe twice, maybe twice a year. Uh, I end up going more now that we're in North Carolina, but um, it's one of the fastest growing towns that I've, I've seen every time I go back there, something's different. I mean, something's been knocked down and rebuilt. You know, they got doctor's offices going all over. It's a regional hospital there. So doctor's offices are replacing this, that, and the other. And, and they've rezoned stuff so grocery stores can't be there anymore. And now they've, you know, put in, rezoned it for medical. But even as you go into the town, it's a college town, and, and things have been redirected and moved. And, you know, I used to know my way around by landmark. So if you came to me and said, you know, how do I get to, uni to the university from where I where I live? I said, I see, you go to the front of the neighborhood. You're going to take the right, and you're going to go, and you're going to see the Shell station on the left, and go through that line. You're going to see Kmart. Go through that line. You're going to get to the next stop site. There's going to be the Pirates Chest on the right hand side. You're going to turn left and go down that hill. On, on the right side, you're going to see the stadium. You can see the, soft, the baseball stadium, you can see the football stadium, and then you'll see the Coliseum. Keep going there, okay? Go to the next light. That's 14th Street, and you know you're at the right place. Just keep going through down Dixon Avenue through 14th Street till you get to 10th Street, and you're going to see the crow's nest on the left-hand side, and you're going to go, if you turn right there, you'll go to College Hill. And if you keep going there down 5th Street, you have to go to the right a little bit, then, if you take a right on Fifth Street, you're gonna the college is gonna be right there on the right. So, depending on where you want to go, that's how you get there. Wow. Right. Yeah. I'm glad we have GPS. <laughs> exactly. But, but things have changed so much now. There, there's, there's no Shell Station. There's no Kmart. There's no Pirates Chest. There's no Crow's Nest. The stadiums are still there. But, uh, but beyond that, there. All those landmarks are gone and been replaced with something else. And every time I come in, there's a new landmark. There's a new, and I'm, you know, I'm from Greenville, and I'm trying to figure out where to go and how to get, what's the quickest way to get there, right? You know, and, and what makes it worse is for the people I'm trying to give directions to, right? Because they want to know how to get there. At least I recognize the streets and, and you know, kind of the way I, I went around. But, but people who need directions need to know what? How to get there, don't we? We're going through Advent, right? We're headed towards where? Christmas. Where are we going at Christmas? To the manger, which is in? Yes, we're headed to Bethlehem. All of us are travelers, and we're headed to Bethlehem on Christmas Day to see. Don't ask him for directions. <laughs> Funny you should say that. <laughs> but, but we're all heading that way, right? We're all heading that way to Bethlehem. This is the time of year in Advent when we all are moving in on Christmas and, and the meaning of Christmas, which is, you know, Christ is born, Emmanuel, God with us, right? That's what we're looking forward to. It's only a few weeks away that we'll celebrate that. But how do we get there? And, and that's what I want to talk about today because the directions, if you ask like the disciples when they were, they were alive, they probably, because it's written in, in each of their Gospels, would say, well, you're going to go right there outside of Jerusalem, the comfort of the city, you're going to hang a right and you're going to go through the desert and just keep going, just keep going and keep going. And eventually you're going to run into the Jordan River. And you'll know it's the Jordan River because it's the only river there. Okay. And you're going to see a guy. He's a little kooky. He's, you know, he, he's wild a little bit. He's, he's uh, going to be wearing a camel shirt. And, and, and he's going to be yelling at the top of his voice, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is the name, right? And, and, and you'll know him because he'll be the one in the in the, in the water up, up to his waist and he'll be baptizing people as fast as he can. One right after another, after another, after another. And the baptism is going to be a, a baptism of what? I just said a minute ago, repentance, right? John preaches a baptism of repentance. And they'll tell you that the way you get to Bethlehem is through John. The way you get to Bethlehem is through John. He's the one that makes the path straight. When you go and you hear his sermon, that one-line sermon, 
Y'all say you ought to try that sometime. <laughs> that <laughs> that one-line sermon is how you get to Bethlehem. That makes sense. Yeah. It does. You see, that that's really what Advent is about. It's about a time of preparation. You know? It's a time about getting ready for the coming of, of, of Christ. And, you know, in reality, unless we had a time machine, we can't go back to, to Bethlehem and see, see the, the Savior laying in, our Savior laying in, uh, in a manger. We can't do that, but Christ is coming a second time. Amen? Amen. He's going to come back. And so we, too, need to hear the words of John when he says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We, too, need to take that warning and look in the mirror and see what it is that we need to change as a person. You see, you can only decide that. I can't tell you that. I don't know your heart. I don't know the things you need to work on. But you do. Right? And then you say, well, that's going to take me out of my comfort zone. I really don't want to change because change is never fun. And you're right. It's not. But it's required. We need to repent, which means to what? To turn around, to turn away from. We need to leave sin behind us and always be moving towards our Savior in all that we do, all that we say, all that we are. Now, if you can look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm doing all those things, well, then you need to talk to your spouse and see if you can get them to do them. And the, uh, but y'all know, this is the time, not that any other time of year is not the time, this is the time we specially focus on just that, that time of preparation. You know, some people would say that, uh, how could y'all baptize with, with such a simple message, you know? If I came in here and we sang a few songs and then I got up here and said, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. If anybody feels like coming forward, come forward. Our, our hymn of dedication is this. Everybody be look, looking around and feel like they're in a time machine or something, right? That's not a sermon. That's one sermon, one line. And look at all he did with one sermon and one line. Preachers could learn something from that today, right? They could. Yeah, there's no, there's no three points. There's no point. There's no illustration. There's no. It's a simple message. Repent, right? And that's not hard to understand. He tells you why to repent, but the main thing you need to hear is repent. You say, "Well, you're not making me feel good, Pastor." Well, I'm sorry. Repent, <laughs> and you'll feel good. You know, you'll get straightened out. You know, there's there's a couple, um, um, excuse me, there's a couple of uh, types of prophets. Now, John would be uh, a prophetic, a prophetic, I can't even talk, prophet. Okay, but there's also a priestly prophet. You know, in today's society, we see prophets as somebody who what sees. The future, right? Okay, that's and that's John. But there's also priestly um, prophets, and what they preach is that uh, you know God's up there, and you're down here, and you know everything's good, and you know we they reduce that relationship into a religion where you know we'll go to church, and we'll put a little money in the in the in the plate, we'll sing a few songs, we'll Try to stay away from the preaching part of it, and then we'll go home, and, and you know everything's good. You know you're okay, I'm okay, we're okay. But John saying the prophetic says just the opposite. It says you're not okay, and I'm not okay, and we need to make a change, right? We need to make some changes. You see. Jesus ain't coming down across for you to stay where you're at. Right? <clears throat> he came so you move forward. Right? So you could experience the peace 
and the comfort that only comes from our experiencing Him on a daily basis. You see, it's a relationship. It's a relationship deal. It's more than a religion. When people say, is, is it about relationship or religion? Right? And it's about both. In the reality, you can't have one. You, you, need, you need both. If, if you look at the definition of religion, it rolls over into relationship and you need both. But for me personally, it's about a relationship. You probably could tell that from the last nine and a half years that I've been here preaching. It's a relationship for me. Um, that's how I see it. That's what I believe it is the relationship with, with Christ. It's personal, but it's communal as well. Right? It's horrible. So it's okay when we say, I'm not okay and you're not okay, as long as we're looking to what? Christ into what? What are we supposed to be doing? Changing. Changing. Yeah. I'm not okay. You're not okay. But we're trying to change. And I'm trying to be a better person today than I was yesterday. And that goes for every day of the week. <coughs> and however long the good Lord will give you on this planet, that should be your goal. Amen? Amen. Amen. You see, by changing... By trying to do better each day, you're drawing closer in your relationship to Christ. Right? If you're sitting at the recliner and you never answer the door, you're never going to know who's out there. Aren't you? You've got to get up and, and meet him. Meet Christ. You need to have that relationship with Christ. You need to Sit down in the, in the, on the couch or wherever, wherever it is and, and have that conversation with him. Right? A real conversation. Or when you look in the mirror and you're looking for truth. You're not looking to, to, to feed your ego. Or you're, to, to feel better about yourself. Well, I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm better than him. Yeah. I'm, you know, if you compare my sins to yeah, I got sins, but he's got some sins. You know what I'm saying? Some serious sins. He's, that's what, yeah. God doesn't give grades for sin. He doesn't say, well, I also see, you know, that's average. A lot of people doing that. And uh, that's failing right there. <laughs> you need to straighten up. You know, he doesn't give grades like that. Sin is a sin, 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 is a sin. Sin is a sin. If you miss the mark, you miss the mark. If you miss it by an inch or two miles, you still miss. Right? And I'm not here to get into your sin. I'm just saying I'm not okay and you're not okay, but we can be okay. It's going to take repentance, right? It's going to take an acknowledgement that we're not where we need to be, although we're working to get there, and then we may need to make some changes. You know, maybe we need to love a little more, give a little more, comfort a little more. Whatever it is we need, be a little more understanding, a little more patient, a little kinder. Whatever it is that we need to do, we need to recognize it and get there. And move ourselves into that, that realm. You see, when you move yourself into that realm, uh, um, it's rewarding. It really is. It's a blessing. Now, I, I'm going to share something that's personal, and it's not in my sermon, but it just came to me is that the, this, this, this moment. So um, it's not too big of a, a bunny hole, man. I'm not just, I just want to touch on it. Um, you know, lately I've been having some new medications. And so you, they, yeah, I know what you're saying. You need a lot of medications. But, but, but I've been trying some new medications. These medications seem to be giving me a high amount of anxiety. Um, and... We're going to get that worked out. But yesterday I was feeling like a um, tremendous amount of anxiety last night. And we had um, made plans to go to this Christmas tree lighting or Christmas tree event um, with my daughter and her, her, you know, their family. And I asked my mom if she wanted to go. And yes, she wanted to go. And as it got closer, I mean... I really wouldn't have gone if, if I hadn't already said something to mom and, 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 and Pam. I was just like, I just was not feeling it. Um, I wasn't feeling good. But you know, I went there and the baby was there 
and my grand other grandsons were there. And one of my other grandsons was having a bad day uh, for different reasons, but, but and I started holding the baby because he was crying. I started talking to my grandsons about different things, and we started experiencing the lights and the thing. And all of a sudden, I wasn't anxious anymore. He was gone. And I had to think, why, why aren't you anxious right now? You, know, you went over there and you were like at your limit. And you're not right now. Why is that? Because I concentrated on them and not on me. You, you see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is a lot of times things come to us because we're self-centered. We're, we're thinking about us and us only. And sometimes when you, you sit there and you turn your attention to somebody else and maybe they're having problems or, or maybe they're crying and just need to be held and just need you to be present, you know, or maybe they need a few kind words of encouragement. Uh, maybe they need a hug. Maybe that, and gentlemen, be careful how you hug, you know, if it's women, folks. So don't, we don't want any divorces in here, all right? But, 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 um... <laughs> Just kidding. But the um, but reality is, you know, sometimes people need a hug. Sometimes they need your presence. Sometimes they need, the, you know, just a kind word. Just something that makes their day. And how often do we hold that back? Because we're more worried about getting to the front of the line. Or I only got five minutes before the ball game starts. So I, I, need, to, I need you to be hurrying up up there so I can check out. You know, you don't need to use those coupons today. You know, if you were using coupons, you should have gone down there. You know, those type of things where we get angry and we get upset when there's no need to be upset, there's no need to be in that bigger hurry. You watch the ball game. Let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm gonna tell you the secret about ball games. And you watch them. And I've watched a lot of ball games in my life. A lot. Whether I'm watching it or not has never changed the way that game turned out. If I watched them lose 30 to nothing, or I didn't watch them lose 30 to nothing, guess what? They still lost 30 to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no need to be in a hurry. Slow down. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. It's, it's good. Life is always good. Even in the midst of strife. Because why? Because God's there. Amen? Now, I've gotten so far down that bunny hole, I don't even know if I'll ever be able to dig back out. But my message to you today is real simple. You know, it's a sermon that, that John gave everybody that will come to the river. It's repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. We place that in our heart during this Advent season and remind us daily of the work we have our head of ourselves. Not to say that you're bad people. I'm not saying that at all. Not at all. I think highly of every person in here. But I think we all can can use a little adjustments. You know, some of us need an overhaul. But 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 <laughs> but. Um, I, I'm not going to name anybody. Don't worry. Um, but uh, I would have to start with me, right? you know, the person who needs adjustment. But but the um, but we do, don't we? Because we're going to Bethlehem, and there's only one way you get to Bethlehem. One way. You get there by going through John. Does that makes sense. That makes sense. Fred, Fred uh, um, Craddock. Um, He's a famous speaker, preacher, but he, he's kind of summed it up like this. So let me read it to you. It says, uh, repent of the arrogant assumption that you alone are favored. That you are exempt from the moral demands put on others. That being better than your worst neighbor is your salvation. As God, as I said earlier, God grades on a curve. Does that pretty much sum it up? Pretty simply put, we need to look inside ourselves. We need to be prepared for what's to come. Be prepared for what's going what's to arrive in Bethlehem and be born into a manger. Emmanuel, 
God with us, be prepared to celebrate that in the, with a true heart of love and compassion. But also live for the day that Christ will come back. And maybe it'll be in our lifetime. Maybe it won't. But it won't change, just like that ball game never changed. If we're here, we're not here, right? He's coming back. He's coming back. Get ready. One line sermon. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.